people said, amen. Yeah, very good, thank you. You may be seated. And uh, as you're seated, just settle in, get relaxed, but not too relaxed. I don't want you sleeping. And Lord knows I'll do my best not to aid you in that endeavor. But let's pray. Father, we thank you this day as we gather to worship, to sing how great thou art, for indeed you are. Thank you for your greatness, your goodness, and mercy manifested for us in Christ our Savior. Speak to us, Heavenly Father, in your word. We pray, O oh God, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let me ask you, have you ever known some people as adults you wish would just finally grow up? Anybody know anybody like that? You know, sometimes all of us without our aid grow physically in physical stature. But there are some people who never seem to grow up. And I, I have to admit, this little bit of a boy is still inside me. My wife says little boys never grow up. The fingerprints just get higher on the wall. But, and, and little boys never grow up. It's just the toys get more expensive, amen? Well, now, the thing is, there, there are some people, let's admit it, that don't grow up uh, and mature emotionally. They're forever little kids. But, you know, there are people that don't grow up spiritually. There are people that forever, oh, they grow in stature, but spiritually they're like little kids. That was one of the things that St. Paul faced with the church at Corinth. We've been looking at the last couple of weeks. He must have thought he was somehow an ecclesiastical babysitter for a bunch of new Christians that were not growing. And, and he called them and he said, I want to treat you like adults spiritually. I want to address you as spiritual men, but you're not even ready for solid food. You're still on the formula. You're, you're children, you're babies. And Paul would probably like to just say, grow up already. Well, he had to be a little bit more tactful than that. But some of the things that Paul led him to believe they're immature is that there were some problems that plagued at church. And they were brought to Paul's attention in the letter. Some of it was they were factious. Some were lining up behind Paul. He said, hey, I didn't die for you guys. Christ did. Some were saying, well, I belong to Peter. And others say, well, I belong to Apollos. And then somebody else said, well, I belong to Christ. That last one was right. You belong to Christ. Paul said, I didn't die if it wasn't me that shed his blood at the cross. It is Christ that died. You belong to him. Christ is not divided. But somehow, in their immature ways, Christ was divided in that church. He said, guys, this is not good. You need to grow up. Then he said that there's other problems that were written to him in this letter by one of the house churches that apparently, uh, he said, there's immorality among you as Christians, that even the pagans won't commit. You're committing immoral acts that the pagans find unacceptable in the pagans from which they had been part of. He said, they don't even do it. You guys have taken sin to a new level. You, you have men, there was reports of men sleeping with their stepmom. He said, the, the pagans don't even do that. One of the other signs that Paul found out of their spiritual immaturity was the fact that they were taking each other to court suing each other in the church. I remember one time a lady fell, and it was tragic. She got injured in church. One of her fellow church members who helped doctor up said, you need to sue the church. And I, I was an intern at the time. I said, are you kidding? You, you're basic. When you sue the church, you're suing yourself. It's like suing your wife because you got injured in the kitchen or something. But, but the thing is, he said, you guys don't have anybody in that church in Corinth that's mature enough, that is wise enough to settle your disputes. You're going to the unbelieving courts. What kind of witness is that against the church? There were others who had under, misunderstandings about, spiritual, about monetary gifts, about giving. Paul addressed that. But what was another sign of their spiritual immaturity was, was the fact that spiritual gifts had begun to divide the church because of their immature ways. See, God has given certain spiritual gifts to the church, gifts that are ostensibly given by the Holy Spirit as he wills for building up or strengthening the church. For example, the gift of teaching, the gift of preaching, serving, shepherding, and so on. And we'll look more at that next week. Paul said these gifts were to build up the body. Instead, they become a, a point of contention. The spiritual gifts that God has given to the church have become a point of division. And it, it's amazing to me when you think about spiritual gifts over the years, over the centuries, how divisive it's been. 
I mean, we, we've had churches torn asunder over spiritual gifts or speaking in tongues and other, other various manifestations of the spirit. Paul said, this is a sign of immaturity. You guys don't know. And, and what I think was happening is they didn't understand gifts. And Paul wrote earlier in this same chapter, I read from a moment ago. He says, now regarding spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. Paul could write that today to the Lutheran church, for example, because there's a lot of ignorance about spiritual gifts. In fact, sometimes when it comes to that part, inspired part of God's word, Lutheran theologians don't know what to do with those, with those teachings on spiritual gifts. They sort of tiptoe around them or give vague generalities. So unfortunately, what are we going to do next week is look at what, what are the spiritual gifts? Because I, I, I know factually. I can say confidently, if you have the Spirit of Christ in you, if you are a Christian, you believe in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit, you have spiritual gifts that God has given you. Say, I do? Now, some of you say, well, I knew that, Pastor said, I didn't know that. But let me tell you, God has given gifts to every member of this church, every member of any church, for one purpose, that's to build us up in our faith so, and to serve one another. Now, keep in mind that as Paul says, I don't want you ignorant this, about spiritual gifts. He then goes on to the very next verse, and he begins to remind them of their pagan lifestyle before they were converted. There's a reason why he did that. I didn't understand at face value why Paul brought that up. Because in paganism, they were known to exploit other people. In other words, they used other people for their own good. In the church, Paul said it's just the opposite. God has called you through the Holy Spirit to serve others, not to use others. What a revolutionary concept in the world. You, God has given you gifts to serve others, not to use or exploit others for your own good. What I sense was happening in the immature ways is that some of these people were feeling, well, I don't know, but you, my gifts don't count for much. They, they are probably saying in Corinth what people say today. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm nobody. I'm just, I'm just a layman. I'll tell you what, if I had a dollar for every time that somebody said, I'm just a layman, I'd, I'd do pretty good. I, I would have to give it away to charity or to the church. But it's amazing over the years how many people say, well, I'm just a layman. Let me tell you, the church, you're all just laymen. The church is a lay movement. It doesn't center around the pastor that is, but one of many gifts. It is a lay movement. Don't ever say, I'm, I'm just a layman. Some of them are saying, well, I don't have his gift. I, I, I can't sing like, well, you can name the name. I can't play the organ like John is. I can't preach like the pastor, so I guess my gift doesn't really matter. Oh, yes, it does. Every gift that God gives to the church is for a purpose, to serve, to build up, to edify the body of Christ. And that's why Paul says, you, you, your foot can't say hand. If I'm not a hand, I, I'm, I don't have a special role. And so there were Christians, I, I, I think it wasn't a lack of self-esteem, it's really Christ-esteem. They thought more lowly of themselves than they ought to. And Paul says, hey, don't think so lowly of yourself that your gift isn't important. It is important. Then on the other end of the spectrum, you've got Christians who are thinking they're God's gift to the church. You ever meet somebody like that? They think they're God's gift to mankind. They think they're God's gift, and they've got a little air about them, a little swagger. There are some people who think they're absolutely indispensable to the church. That's an attitude, a carnal attitude that's not good. I remember the pastor that confirmed me. He used to have a little thing on his wall. It was framed. And, and it said, uh, it was a note, the indispensable man. If you think you're indispensable, here's what I want you to do. Roll up your sleeve all the way. Make a fist and put your fist in a bucket of water and hold it there for a few seconds. Then after a few seconds, remove your hand. The hold that remains, that is how much you will be missed. There is no such thing as an indispensable person, but there are those that are haughty. I think what was happening, certain people had certain gifts that had stature, had standing in the church. They were the coveted gifts. And if you had that coveted gift, that's because God saw fit, because God trusted you. No, the gifts of God are given by the Holy Spirit as he wills according to his grace, just like salvation itself. And so some of them think, I'm somebody, and they look, you know, there are people that look down their nose at you, you know, there are people that have a condescending attitude. Paul said, look, I don't care what part you are in the body. You could be a foot, you could be a hand, you could be an eye, you could be an ear. And it's amazing how he uses this, this body language. Why? Because there are certain illustrations that Paul uses throughout his letters 
to try to explain how the, the, the church of Christ functions. One place, Paul likens it to an army. Another place, Paul says the church functions like a building with all these different bricks, and you've got a foundation and a cornerstone. He said, let me tell you, in the church, Christ is the cornerstone, the most important stone in the structure, the foundation is the apostles and the prophets, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then Paul says, and you, dear, dearly beloved in Christ, together, corporately, as living stones, are cemented together by the Holy Spirit to form a dwelling place for God and His Spirit. Now, in the retail business now, we talk about brick and mortar stores. When I say a brick and mortar store uh, versus a virtual store, you know what I'm talking about, right? You understand that a brick and mortar store, it's like you go down to the store, it's really there, you walk in, grab your car, do your shopping, check out, and go home. A virtual store is an online site where you can buy the same merchandise, only you don't have to leave home. Now, it's understood in the retail sector today, if you don't have an online presence, you're not going to be in business long. Brick and mortar versus online or virtual. Now, I, I don't want to compare the church to a virtual reality online because there's more substance. But the church of Jesus Christ is primarily a spiritual institution made up not of brick and mortar, but of people. You see, brick and mortar just gives us a place to get out of the elements of these cold winds constant mornings. Not a bad thing to have, is it? But this brick and mortar is not the church. And I know some of you said this morning, well, let's get up, we're going to church. It's too bad we think we're going to church or we're having church. No, we are the church. Together, individually, we form living stones to make up the body of Christ. And Paul says every one of, every one of these bricks is an, uh, is an important part of this uh, edifice. Every believer in Christ is an important part of the church. And when one member is hurting, we all hurt together. When one is rejoicing, we rejoice together. All of you are important no matter what your part is. And then he goes to the body. He says, okay. You're like the human body with all its parts. And no one part is less than another. No one part is more important than the other. He says, oh, I know we have the body. You understand. He says, there are modest parts of the body we keep covered. Yes, there are. He said, but there's lots of parts in the body. And you know that you have two hands. Let me see. If you have two hands, hold your hands up. Wave your hands. Now, don't worry. We're not being, okay, you all have hands. Wave your hands this morning. Good. Okay, now. I, I was going to have you wave your feet, but that just would be awkward. So I, what I want you to do is I want you to stamp your feet. Okay, good. So we've established we have two hands and we have two feet, don't we? Okay, now, how many of you want to make a case where your hands are more important than your feet? Okay, let me word it a different way. How many of you think your feet are more important than your hands? Let me illustrate this further. Okay. How many of you have a license? How many of you drove here this morning to get to church? Raise your hand if you drove. Okay. How many of you dream of driving someday? Raise your hand if you don't have. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, they'll be getting on the road just about the time I'm retiring. Hallelujah. Woo. But anyway, more kids in the road. But let me ask you, a, a, those of you that were driving this morning, as you got in that car, cold as it was, which was more important to getting here, your feet or your hands? You needed them both, didn't you? Now, especially if you have a manual transmission, you need both feet. Those operate the clutch, the brake, and the gas. And, and those feet actually have, they have to work together, don't they? If, if you hit the gas and the brake at the same time, it's going to be really, you're going to confuse your car. Those feet are important to getting here safely. Your hands are indispensable to driving. Now, when you came here this morning, drivers, which was more important, your safe arrival, your ears, your eyes? They are both indispensable, necessary to getting here. The point is, Paul is saying, look, God has given to your body ears and eyes. One is not more important than the other. I remember arguing that with a friend when I was about nine, 10 years old. Hey, if you lost one or the other, which would you rather lose, your hearing or your eyes? And we came, oh, I'd rather lose my hearing. Well, I'd rather lose my eyesight. I could still hear, yeah, but I could still see. Now, those are questions we don't have the wisdom at 10 years old to answer. That's so dumb. I suppose that if it came down to an accident where they had to say, uh, save one limb or the other, you might have a tough time deciding. 
They're all indispensable. Paul says, you're like a member of the body of Christ. As, as a member, you are indispensable. God has wired you. God has called you. God has gifted you to be part of the body. You're not less important than anyone else. You all have a vital role. Now, to further amplify what Paul's saying, uh, hands and feet and eyes and ears, he said, what about if you didn't have that sense of smell? Now, I suppose of all the senses, all the things that we do that make us who we are, I suppose I could live without the sense of smell. In other words, I would never smell the altar flowers again. I would never smell homemade bread or pie. Boy, that would be a bummer. But basically, I could function pretty good. I remember a lady who was seriously injured in a motorcycle accident, came out relatively unscathed except the trauma to her head. She lost her sense of smell. Nothing life-threatening there except they had to go to an electric stove, an electric appliance, because she couldn't smell gas. All of our senses, all of our hands, all of our limbs, our eyes are all important. They, they serve a function, but they have a different function, different unique function. Does it make it more special than other? You have a different gift than I do. You have gifts. Some of you have gifts that I'll never have. And it doesn't make you superior. It doesn't make you inferior. One, in Christ, you have a purpose. But to amplify what Paul says, you think about your internal organs. Which do you think is more important, your brain or your heart? Which one would you rather give up? Well, I, I, I can't give up either one. Of course you can't. You need your heart to live. You need your brain to live. The brain needs the heart. The heart needs the brain. They don't, the one is not more important than the other. They can't get along without each other. Now, there may be organs you think, well, they're not as important, say, like a kidney or a bladder. Now, that bladder doesn't uh, provide the function, the importance of a brain or a heart. But let it malfunction, let it be under pressure, and you know how important that bladder really is. Because if it don't function, if it shuts down, everything shuts down. Even the smallest, most insignificant organs that we don't know until they're not functioning. For example, the liver, maybe it doesn't seem like as big a deal as the heart or the brain. I'll tell you what, if your liver stops, you're done. It, it's an organ that, that's invisible. It doesn't call attention to it. doesn't stamp its feet or wave its hands. It just functions quietly. You only notice your liver when it don't function very well anymore. Every internal organ, one is as important as the other. The heart functions differently than the brain, the brain and the liver, the brain from the kidneys, the lungs, and so on. They're all important. And then you have to amplify what Paul is saying about the body using body language. You have all these different systems, internal systems that are, in, are vital to your life and well-being. You've got the circulatory system, the respiratory system, the central nervous system, the skeletal system. Which system do you think is most important? Which one are you willing to give up or live without? They're all, they all function different. Now, you, you can't say, well, I, I think I would rather give up the skeletal system. Really? You'd be a blob of jelly. You, you, can't, you can't give up your central nervous system. You can't give up the respiratory system. You, you would not live. Point I'm making, Paul says, every member of the body of Christ, just like the physical body, is indispensable. He says, all of you are gifted. All of you have an important role in the church. You're not, first of all, to those of you that think, oh, I'm just a layman, nonsense. You are redeemed in Christ. You are somebody to God. You are somebody to Christ. You play an indispensable role in the church. And to those that are haughty, humility is always the order of the day in the body of Christ. One of the things you think of body life in the church, we need each other to build each other up. We're going to talk more about these different gifts. Maybe we need to get to a point where you begin to ask God, the Holy Spirit, to show you, reveal to you personally what gift you have and how you can best serve him. And the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about you serving, discovering the gift that God has given you to serve this church, is because unlike going to a Packers game, church is not a spectator sport where you sit back and watch others do ministry, that you watch others perform the church. It is not a spectator sport. Too often we have to confess we treat church like spectators. We come and we spectate and we watch. The time has come for us to begin to pray, God, show me the gift that you've given me, and then help me to serve you in the church that you might be glorified in my life. I can't tell you what gift. I can help you grow spiritually, explore and discover what gift you might have. 
ultimately that comes, there's a whole bunch of gifts. Some of you might even have a spiritual gift, for example, of hospitality. Didn't even know you had it. Some of you have the gift of discernment. You say, well, I can't preach a sermon on Sunday morning, but I could smell error when I hear it. I could smell error, by the way. That's called the gift of discernment. There's a whole bunch of gifts you didn't even know God had given to the church. You probably have those and don't even know it. What I want to challenge you is to help so you can play your part of building the body of Christ so that through this church, the gospel is advanced and God is glorified in Christ. Let us pray. Father, it is no longer sufficient for us to be spectators in the church, but to serve a vital role. And Father, it may be that we have to dust off this time, talent, and treasure sheets and see what we checked off and earnestly commit our, our time and talent to you because you hold us accountable for those gifts. We have Christ, we have redemption, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the gifts that you've given to your church. For that, we're eternally grateful. In Jesus' name, amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen. One of the great joys of...